The introductory segment of Gurren Lagann has always been interesting to me personally for a number of reasons. It does a lot that one would expect an establishing section to do. Introducing an epic scope, building the world, and very quickly adhering the audience to the characters and main mantra of the work. It is also quite different stylistically from the rest of the story, with the tone and feel of the progression and conflicts giving off a bit of a deceptive impression of where the story might be headed. But related to this stylistic approach, what is so interesting about this opening act is that it is a narrative red herring, something verging on a masterstroke of expectation subversion. And what's important is that this is not a subversion done for subversion's sake, but something completely consistent with the way this universe and the characters within it function, and thus a benefit to the story. Looking at it retrospectively, it is intentionally what many would consider the weakest act, using very logical reasons that can only be deduced after you know the entire story to perpetuate an impression of false one-dimensionality. However, before expanding on this, let's get into a couple of traditional criticisms that can be levied at the early episodes of Gurren Lagann, before discussing how these elements are actually very appropriate, even if it doesn't change the fact that a good portion of these episodes are pretty silly. First of all, it can be hard for new watchers to feel some genuine weight and investment in the events and conflicts early on, simply because the show doesn't really take them seriously. With the slight exception of Episode 7, there is very little tension in any of these battles, even if our heroes genuinely have a difficult time and don't end up winning. Now, this can be explained due to the general tone of these episodes being one of pretty lighthearted adventure, with the emphasis on overcoming the odds. But I think a bigger reason for this is in the characterization and approach taken with the villains. These adversaries are simply put, shallow. Ranging from the random grunts, who are essentially cheesy cannon fodder, to Viral, who, despite being comfortably the most important antagonist here, is sometimes even treated as comic relief. Early on, the antagonists are hardly given any weight, and are quite devoid of substance. <laughs> They're not fleshed out, there's no depth, and we aren't given any explanations for their motivations other than them needing to kill the humans for some reason. They are not treated as anything other than humorous obstacles, and this makes it difficult to care much, and to be emotionally invested the first time around. The second supposed criticism here is probably the most controversial yet significant one that has been leveled at the series and it pertains to our beloved leader, the driving force for these opening episodes. Kamina is the endearing, determined leader of Team Daigurin, and retrospectively it's easy to look at him with rose-tinted glasses. But he doesn't appear here to be an extremely balanced character, and one could be forgiven for feeling like his brand of leadership leaves a bit to be desired. Kamina is essentially the symbol of the show, the thematic drill from which the entire narrative bases itself off of, so one would assume that his display of leadership would be traditionally exemplary, inspirational and charismatic, but backed up with extreme interpersonal intelligence, a knack for strategy, and a knowledge and demonstration of the best course of action in varying circumstances. But quite frankly, Kamina does not meet those specific expectations in full. He's charismatic, confident, and he leads by example, but ultimately what he boils down to is someone who spouts the same platitudes without much variation, recklessly and foolishly leading into battle, outwardly being a bit of a bonehead goof used for comedy a lot of the time rather than a genuine, stable leader. Kamina essentially just repeatedly says the same few phrases over and over with the hopes that drilling in this philosophy will bring about positive results. And apart from a few very subtle hints about his father and a couple of key quotes, this early arc doesn't really try to add many dimensions to him. But although he is scoffed at by some characters, the story by and large treats him like the pinnacle of inspiration. It creates some dissonance between what is being portrayed, proportionate to what the story perceives that importance to be, and this 
combined with the cannon fodder approach to antagonists that I mentioned, leads to a feeling of superficiality. Gravitas is important, and apart from the story's admirable philosophy and good world building, it's hard to become invested when the show doesn't give you many reasons to. But the end of episode 8 understandably changes everything, and the story does a 180. Though the introduction of Nia gradually brings the story back to its lighthearted fun, the dynamics are changed. Everything now has weight, themes of self-actualization and grief are introduced, moving on from the death of a loved one and integrating their memory while being your own person. The inner duality of all these characters becomes more apparent, the plot opens up, antagonists with gravity are introduced, true development occurs, the universe mechanics are delved into, and the story is benefited exponentially by this. Comparatively, the introductory episodes are probably the relatively weakest section of the show, and one could definitely understand why they might be hard to buy into for some watchers. Things are established well from the beginning, but despite that, everything seems a bit shallow. But that is the point. It is shallow, because these characters are simply putting on an act or playing a role, doing what they need to do rather than what they truly feel because of their personal circumstances. We find out later that in the hopes of combating the spiral nemesis and maintaining the survival of the world, a custom of tyranny has been established to keep populations below the limit. As such, the setting is one of utmost oppression, and the people have learned generation after generation that there is no point to hope for a better future. The legacy passed down is one of fear and learned helplessness for the oppressed but what's key here is that it is also true for the oppressors. There are two sides to this. The Beastmen, and especially Viral, they have no idea why they're doing what they're doing. They've just been told to hunt and hate humans by Lord Genome and their superiors. Some may enjoy this, but there is no deeply rooted, substantial motivation other than killing for an unknown duty, and that is why they're so shallow. Just as the people in the underground villages, they are told what to do and told not to ask questions, a thematic mirror image of those they are hunting. There is no weight to these characters early on because they have no conviction. They are only carrying out roles handed down all the way from the anti-spirals to combat the spiral nemesis. And we see later on that Vero was never really that type of person in the first place, which adds much needed context to the supposed lack of punch to him as an antagonist. At heart, he really isn't much of a villain anyway, so why should there be a false conviction to his actions? These villains being superficial was entirely appropriate both logically and thematically, and it is quite a poignant idea. After all, the closest thing to a villain in Gurren Lagann is the abstract idea that you cannot achieve the seemingly impossible. Now, for Kamina, there is an even better reason and more emotional weight tied to his narrow-minded, stubborn, one-dimensional approach. Kamina lives as the legacy of a great man. His father was truly impressive, able to make it to the surface and explore the unknown as Kamina stayed in Jiha village, too afraid to follow. At the start of the series, he breaks through to the surface to reach his father, and after seeing his corpse, he pursues the improbable in the hopes of restoring humanity to the surface and building the prosperous world that his father sought. But on his own, he does not know how to do this. He admits that he'd be lost without the brains and solid foundation that Simon provides him, and he is all too aware of his limitations. But he is also way more intelligent than he lets on, and he acts the way he does partly because he knows Simon's limitations too. He wants to be the person everyone needs, even if he didn't know how to be more. He doesn't know how to be a great leader, he's just doing what he knows. Just doing his best, projecting an opposite reaction to the insecurities that he actually feels to try and inspire those around him. Kamina genuinely sacrifices quite a bit during his time in Gurren Lagann. This persona is without doubt a big part of him, but he exaggerates it. 
wearing a mask to be the hero that these people needed. Maybe not the perfect leader now, but the type of symbol who would later inspire one. And he also knows that Simon is currently a bit lost himself, so he is exactly what he needs to be to inspire his brother. The words, the agency, the brawn. He does not need a brain and he does not need resourcefulness because Simon already has that. Nah, Simon. ああ、そうだ。後ろに目があると生まれた故郷が離れていくのしか見えねえ。それじゃあ人は前には進めねえ。目が前にありゃ、歩いていけば遠くの景色が近づいてくる。だから人は前に進める。as said, Kamina just spouts platitudes to Simon, repeating himself. Your drill is the drill that will pierce the heavens. Believe in the me that believes in you. Who the hell do you think I am? Rinse and repeat, over and over and over again. It isn't perfect, but a constant reminder can leave traces. He hopes that if he keeps drilling this into Simon, it will bear fruit and turn him into the man he wants to be. And it does. The reason why he only ever faces forward, even when it was ill-advised, is because Simon didn't need advice on how to be safe. He needed a push. Through sheer force and repetition, and with a little help from Nia, those platitudes truly changed Simon for the absolute better. Kamina was an extremely imperfect person, plagued by insecurity and doubt. But he hardly ever let it show during his life, supporting and dragging those around him towards a better future. Through sheer determination and a knowledge of one's strengths, waves can be made and the world can be changed. It's not until his absence that the value of his words and presence is really felt, and that tells you all you need to know about Kamina. A man who, despite his flaws, was exactly who he needed to be for all of those around him. Who put on a stupid, valiant mask and persevered when he himself didn't really have that much confidence. Doing it the only way he knew how. Not the perfect leader, not the perfect man but a true hero nonetheless. The opening act is arguably the weakest one in the show for this general feeling of generic shallowness in some aspects. But that is an illusion, a false display that the story tricks you with that can only be realized afterwards. On the first watch, one wonders why there is such little gravitas to these encounters, why the show treats Kamina as a hero when he seems more like a reckless idiot, why Viral is treated as comic relief when he's the closest thing to a big bad villain, but it all flips on its head through a clever, ironic tonal wink to this deception. There's no gravitas to these encounters because the Beastmen never really had their heart in it. Kamina is treated as a hero despite repeating the same seemingly insubstantial platitudes because he is a hero just doing the best that he can, and because those platitudes are given weight later. Now, don't mistake me. This is all an extremely risky maneuver, and the fact that prospective criticism is countered by later events does not completely make the shallow or dumb moments more enjoyable for those who didn't like it in the first place. It is likely a big reason as to why a lot of people drop it early on and disregard the series as stupid, and that is a bit of a problem. But regardless, there is no disputing that this twist is intelligent, and adds a new layer of appreciation to the series characteristic of the duality that it operates in. Note that I don't mean to imply that these opening episodes were all a complete 100% intentional facade that the writers decided to pull. I'm simply pointing out that there is narrative logic behind these aspects, but there were plenty of other functions. The early, relatively more lighthearted tone is a good way to organically make these characters endearing, and a great way to habituate the watcher to the mundane so that the hammer blows later on achieve maximum effect. 
As said earlier, the sense of epic scope is palpable from Episode 1, the concept of drilling to the heavens a theme from the start. Episode 5 foreshadows the later revelations about the spiral nemesis and introduces the societal implications of this forced oppression on the beings of this world, and the early lines from Rossiu hint at how he becomes a man who he warns the others against. <laughs> Also, as early as Episode 1, we are able to see little glimpses of Simon's inner thrill-seeker, his exhilaration and deep yearning for a place beyond what seems possible, hidden underneath his cowardly, comfort-seeking exterior. We are also given little bits of symbolic and thematic foreshadowing, such as the way Simon pilots the brain and Kamina pilots the heart, or the cape motif. Through the cape, Kamina's father passes his will onto him, and he passes that spirit into Simon through the little bit that rips off. It's just a subtle little bit of theming about legacy, learning about those who have touched your life, integrating them within to make yourself a better person through their spirit, while also being your own person. So it's clear that there are a multitude of functional foundations set in this act but they are ever so slightly hidden beneath these antics, overshadowed by this falsely superficial feel, and a tone that, while deceptive, is completely consistent and logical given the story that we are witnessing. It's a series of personas, of masks, a really quite meta element that the series achieves here through some emotional theming, while also being the fun, unpredictable thrill ride that we all know and love. Many thanks for watching.